But this is the part where, for me, I've got to tell you how the truth really works. And if anybody comes and says, oh, I know the truth, I'm so wise, I know everything, without admitting how they found it and why they got it and how it works, and that showing the humility of what it takes to gain knowledge. You see, my dad's got me back, now I'm in the West. I've been to Al-Azhar for almost a year, now I've been to Bosnia, and my dad, he's like, look, you gotta settle down, now's the time to get married, you know, to get into a business. And so we start this warehouse business, and I'm selling dollar store products, convenience store products, we've got this warehouse, and the whole business is going, we're supplying other people, and you know, I've got two or three partners, and we're making a little bit of money, but not really, but I'm busy on a somewhat nine to five schedule, almost six or seven days a week, and I'm trying to get weekends off and go out and train. You know, I'm involved in the masjid and the mosques and the community. And this is the point where people in a group start to come up with crazy ideas. So now we're thinking, all right, if we're in a real war, it's light versus dark, and we're soldiers of the light, and they're fighting dark, what are we going to do? Right? What are we going to do? All right, maybe we go dark, maybe we get into what? Robbing banks, bank robbing, start committing crime. What, old school, like the 1920s? That's kind of crazy. All right, drug dealing. You go into the drug dealing, dealing in drugs. Afghanistan, poppy, heroin, marijuana. Do you really want to get into that? You start getting into all the crazy ideas because now you're thinking, you're a mujahid, you're working over here, you're in the West, you're working against the system. It's your job to try and destroy the country from within. You start thinking like a counterinsurgency, right? I'm an insurgent. No, they're the insurgent. We're the counterinsurgents. No, I'm the insurgent. Ah, you can't even make it up straight. But your, your, your perception of morality starts to get screwed because you think, because you're right, that you can use any means necessary. Hmm. I'm a kid. You know, my dad's telling me, you better focus, son. I can see where you're going. You're going to end up in jail. I'm like, okay, whatever, right? Like, the fear of jail is supposed to scare me. That's just crazy. Why would I end up in jail? Right? And we keep going through this situation and before we know it, I'm thinking, okay, what I really need to do is organize, right? Really train people tactics. I've got people going into the woods. We're training tactics. We're training military uh, strategy. We've got weapons. We're going through real strategy. We've got a group of people. At one point, I don't know, more than, you know, enough people. But <laughs> I get this crazy idea real early in the 90s. What if I actually used the sport of paintballs, guns, to train people? You see, paintballing was just becoming popular. And I remember walking into this Circle K next to our warehouse where we sold merchandise and noticing this magazine with weapons, but then they turned out to be paintballs. And then I looked through this magazine and there's people selling paintball and paintball supplies here in Houston, Texas. And I'm like, whoa, that's cool. And before I know it, I'm off going to check this guy's uh, place and he's got all these paintball supplies and all these paintballs. And he's like in this apartment, in an apartment complex and I'm checking it all out. And I've got this tripped out idea going through my mind. Okay, I'll buy all these uh, paintball guns and then we'll create the group and have actual strategic training and do it a little bit more lifelike where we'll actually use paintballs, create better simulations. I mean, this is just advanced concepts, early, early 90s. One thing leads to another, one thing leads to another, crazy idea leads to crazy idea. Oh, Brother Glenn, are you still with me? I'm parked outside the guy's apartment. I don't know how many days later. Smash the window. Break in. Go inside. 
Start going through all the gear. Packing stuff in. Breaking and entering, brothers and sisters. For some reason, the idea of paying for the stuff that I wanted was too difficult. It's not like my, my family didn't have money. I mean, I could get money from my family. It's just that my father or mother would ask what I was doing and I didn't even want them to know that I was going to buy paintball guns. And the concept of morality had gotten so screwed that the idea of stealing something had somehow been turned into a concept that was feasible because I was now a mujahid who had been so exposed to death that I didn't fear anything and I thought now the right of being in the right gave me the right to do something wrong. I'm in the middle of the fracking living room packing crap into a duffel bag and the knock on the door. Security guard. I leave the fracking bag, run, take the sliding door, jump out, run over, run outside, jump the hoop, run through the complex, and run down the street like a Fracking bat out of hell, scared out of my mind, adrenaline pumping, thinking, what the hell am I doing? I'm running for my life. I'm a criminal on the run. I just got almost caught on a B&E, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I left the shit in the house with a bag with my friggin' name on it, and my car's parked outside the apartment, and I'm running down the street, and I don't have a clue what I'm doing, brothers and sisters. I walk around the block, come all the way back to the little convenience store over there, buy a Dr. Pepper, take my hoodie that I'm wearing off, wrap it around my waist. And like every criminal, I go back to the scene of the crime and walk right back into the apartment complex. And there, what do I find? I find a group of people. Right? Crowds already formed. Cop cars are there. You know, I've waited 10, 15 minutes. Walked around for a while. So I walk back slowly towards the crowd. I see a little line as the crowd is, you know, back behind the perimeter. There's a couple of cops over there. And I just stand there in the back of the crowd looking to see what's going on. I sit on the curb. I don't even remember how long it was, my brothers and sisters. And I'm sitting there thinking that I have no idea what I'm doing. Why did I even do this? And I'm trying to decide what to do. My car's parked right in front of the house still. And I'm just sitting there. There's two cop cars parked behind my car in front of the apartment. And I'm sitting there on the curb, just drinking a soda. And I know for a fact, as clear as day in open light, that they don't recognize me. I'm sitting right there. <laughs> right? I'm sitting right there in the crowd. And I know for sure that I can get up and walk away and no one would stop me. But I don't know where to go. And the embarrassment and the shame. Ah, they tell you people always come back to the scene of the crime. <laughs> oh, my brothers and sisters who have ever been criminals on this earth. Oh, my brothers and sisters who have ever been in jail. This is your wake-up call. I think we come back to the scene of the crime because there's that little bit of left in you. Even after you've committed a crime, knowing that if you still try to redeem yourself, 
It's still possible. But if you run away, you run away forever, right? And there's nowhere you can run to. The earth is not big enough for you to run away from your crimes. I don't know what came over me. <laughs> I don't know what made me act so irrationally. I don't know what made me not run home, catch a cab, claim that the car was stolen, be on the next plane to Brazil or some country without extradition. I don't know why I didn't jump ship to Canada or something else, you know, make a fake ID, any crazy thing. I stayed there in the parking lot of the apartment watching the comps. Till the sun set till the sun set, my brothers and sisters. After the sun set and it got so dark that I thought it started to get night and these guys are going to start wrapping it up. I mean, it had been a long time. I finally got the courage, stood up, put my soda down, walked right up past the police cars, up to the front door and a policeman steps out and I say, my name's Salim Siddiqui. I'm the guy you're looking for. What? What do you mean? I said, I did this B&E. I broke in. I don't remember what I said exactly. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm in cuffs. I'm being put into the back of the car. And the security guard's looking at me and smiling at me. He's giving me a dirty look through the window with a little crack as I'm cuffed in the back seat. And everybody in the crowd is still staring at me. And the security guard is going, you must have cased the joint, right? You must have really cased that joint. There were so many weapons in there. You probably knew he was a, he was a cop, right? You probably cased the joint. And I'm thinking it to myself, I didn't case the joint at all. I didn't plan anything. I'm the most pathetic criminal that has ever existed. Hmm. So, brothers and sisters, you heard it. I'm going to jail. Now, you see, I would have been scared going to jail if it had been the first time. But it wasn't the first time I had been held against my will. And all of those who understand the deen and call themselves mujahid and claim to be on the path know that we take the standard of those who we listen to by asking if they've ever been in jail. Now, in the old school, it used to be people were in jail in Egypt against the government. People were in jail in Saudi Arabia. The government puts you in jail in Pakistan or in any country where the government has put Muslims in jail. Oh, Mr. President, I now live in a country, America, where you put Muslims in jail. But see, I wasn't going to jail for being a Muslim. I was going to jail for committing a crime. But I had already been held in detention or on a military base, or with the other Mujahideen, as one of the first things that I didn't even tell you about on my trip to Bosnia. Yeah, I was put in a POW camp, <laughs> right? So the idea of being afraid in jail didn't occur to me. I had already gotten the jail school approval. I had already been a Mujahid who had been incarcerated or had been put in jail or detained for being a Muslim. This time I was going to jail for being a criminal. And the thing that hurt the most was the fact that I did not want to call home and tell them what I had done. But to see my dad's face Oh, brothers and sisters, my name's Salim Siddiqui. And this is how the story goes. Salaamu Alaikum.